from Shakespeare. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the performance will be about two hours and 45 minutes. The first act is long, about an hour and 25. There's an intermission. The second act is short and races toward a full-on battle. Yeah. Thank you for that. You can't take him anywhere. He does that downtown. <laughs> but that leads me to the issue of safety. The corridor between the seats and now that, that first row of benches, all up along the stairs here and on the side and all over that side where Nick is standing with that rather odd vest, those are out of bounds areas, particularly in the second act. Please, please respect that or you may find an actor bearing down on you with a sword, okay? <laughs> Seriously, so please respect that. Couple other things, no flash photography, please. And I'm supposed to tell you where the emergency exits are, but as we're in a park, go where you like. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, the Curtain Theatre is going to take you back in history. So let us, on your imaginary forces, work. The year is 1403, and merry old England is in turmoil. King Richard II has been deposed, imprisoned, and eventually executed by his cousin Bolingbroke, who has taken the throne and now reigns as King Henry IV, and here she comes with her counselors. But as Shakespeare would have, to have it, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. The new king's reign is never quiet, for by deposing the legitimate king, she has shattered the principle of hereditary succession, which is at the very core of political stability in England. If Bolingbroke can depose the king, why can't someone else? And there are noble challengers, great families from the north, led by the Duke of Worcester, his sister, the Earl of Westmoreland, and her ever valiant son, Harry Percy, known as Hotspur. <laughs> the king has two sons. The first and youngest one, the youngest son, is the dutiful Prince John, this good-looking guy here. Yeah. And then there is the older son and heir apparent to the throne, Prince Hal! Hey! 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 Hal, here you go, Hal, come on, Hal! Yeah. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> As you can tell, Hal likes to have fun. Indeed, much to the chagrin of his mother, rather than spending his time at court, he likes to spend all his days in the pubs of London drinking and carousing with his mates! <laughs> including, including that huge hill of flesh and lord of misrule, Sir John Falsey! <laughs> so, now you know our three groups of protagonists. We have the royals, we have the rebels, and we have the pub crawlers. <laughs> now, being actors, I know they would love your support, so we're gonna help them, all right? All the people in the seats on this side of the aisle, in the white seats, you are going to be royalists. So when I point to you, I want you to roar your support with a loud shout of, to the king! Are you ready? Here we go. To, to the, the king! king! Excellent, excellent. You guys on this side, the seats on this side, you're going to be rebels. So when I point to you, I want you to show your allegiance with a loud yell of Hotspur. You ready? Hotspur! Now, all you people in the cheap seats back here. You guys look like a you guys look like a fun crowd. So I'm gonna have you support Prince Hal, Falstaff, and the pub crawlers. So when I point to you, I want you to raise your arms or the glass in it if you can. Give a, a lusty shout of cheers. You ready? Cheers! Okay, here we go. We're gonna do this for real. You ready? To the king! Hot flash! Cheers! Hot flash! Cheers! Incredible! You guys are so good. We may have to give you a discount on your ticket price. Uh, but look, now you know the basis of our plot, you know our key characters, so let's start this show with a song! Oh, and the dance! <laughs> Jolly old England, <laughs> not 
not so long ago a usurper came to take the crown. Now more blood may flow. Where's young Alice sitting at the Boar's Head Tavern, drinking with a fat old man? Who's his pal? False Snap is his name, and he's calling for another can. Young Hal's the heir apparent, but he pays all that no mind. <laughs> Cannot win the love of his errand, drink until he's almost blind. Where's young Hal? He's sitting at the Boar's Head Tavern, drinking with a fat old man. Who is his pal? Falstaff is his name, and he's calling for another can. Now our ruler loves young Hotspur. Hotspur! Thinks he's the best of sons. Wishes Hal was a changeling child, traded for the other one. Oh, where's young Hal? So kindly please turn them off. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the show. Let's go find the others. shall now, in mutual and well-beseeming ranks, march all one way, and no more be opposed against acquaintance, kindred, and allies. The edge of war, like an ill-sheathed knife, shall no more cut his master. But let me hear from you, my gentle cousin Westmoreland, what yesternight our council did decree in forwarding this dear expedient. My liege, yesternight there came a post from Wales, laden with heavy news, <laughs> whose worst was that the noble Mortimer leading the men of Hereford to fight against the irregular and wild Glendower was by the rude hands of that Welshman taken. A thousand of his people butchered, upon whose dead corpse there was such misuse, such beastly, shameless transformation by those Welsh women done. This may not be without much shame retold or spoken of. Then, more uneven and unwelcome news came from the north, and thus it did import on Holyrood Day the gallant Hotspur there, the young Harry Percy, and the brave Douglas, that ever valiant and approved knight. At home it had met where they did spend a sad and bloody hour as per discharge of their artillery and shape of likelihood, the news was told. For he that brought them in the very 
heat of their contention did take course, uncertain of the issue in any way. Why, here is a dear, a true industrious friend, Sir Walter Blunt, new lighted from his horse, stained with a variation of each soil betwixt that home did and this seat of ours, and he hath brought us smooth and welcome news. The Earl of Douglas is discomfited. <laughs> Ten thousand bold Scots, two and twenty knights balked in their own blood, did Sir Walter see on Holmden's plains. Of prisoners, Hotspur took more Dake, the Earl of Fife, and eldest son to beaten Douglas, and the Earls of Atoll, Murray, Angus, and Menteith. Oh, is this not an honorable spoil, a gallant prize, eh, cousin, is it not? Oh, in faith, it is a conquest the prince could boast of. Yea. There thou makest me sad, and makest me sin in envy that my lord Northumberland should be the mother of so blessed a son, a son who is the theme of honor's tongue, among a grove the very straightest plant, who is fair fortune's minion and her pride, whilst I, in looking on the praise of him, see riot and dishonor stain the brow of my young Harry that it could be proved some night-tripping fairy exchanged in cradle clothes our children where they lay and called mine Percy, hers Plantagenet, <laughs> then I should have her Harry, she mine. But let him from my thoughts. <laughs> what say you cause of this young Percy's pride? The prisoners which he in this adventures has surprised, to his own use he keeps and sends me word I shall have none but more Dake, Earl of Fife. This is his uncle's teaching. This is Worcester, malevolent to you in all aspects, which makes him prune himself and bristle up the crest of youth against your dignity. Yeah, well, I have sent for him to answer this. Cousin, on Wednesday next, our council we will hold at Windsor, so inform the lords. But come yourself with speed to us again, for there is more to be said and to be done than out of anger can be uttered. I will, my liege. <laughs> Sleeping upon benches after noon, that thou hast forgotten to demand that which thou wouldst truly know. What a devil hast thou to do with the time of the day? Unless hours were cups of sack, and minutes capons, and clocks the tongues of bawds. I see no reason why thou shouldst be so superfluous to demand the time of the day. Nay, thou comest near me now, Hal, for we that take purses go by the moon and the seven stars, 
not by Phoebus see that wandering knight so fair. But I prithee, sweet lad, when thou art king, as God save thy grace, majesty, I should say, for grace thou wilt have none. <laughs> what? None? <laughs> no, not so much as will serve as prologue to an egg and butter. Well, how then? Come roundly, roundly. Nay then, sweet wag, when thou art king, let not us that are squires of the knight's body be called thieves of the day's beauty. <laughs> let us be Diana's foresters, <laughs> gentlemen of the shade, Minions of the moon. Oh, and let men say we be men of good government, being governed as the sea is by our noble and chaste mistress, the moon, under whose countenance we steal. Thou sayest well, and it holds well, too, for uh, the fortune of us that are the moon's men doth ebb and flow like the sea, being governed as the sea is by the moon. For proof now, a purse of gold most resolutely snatched on Monday night and most uh, dissolutely spent on Tuesday morning. <laughs> well, got with swearing, lay by and spent with crying, bring in now in as low an ebb as the foot of the ladder, and by and by in as high a flow as the ridge of the gallows. <laughs> hey, I'll say true. And is not my hostess of the tavern a most sweet wench? As the honey of Hybla, my old <laughs> lad of the castle. And is not a buff jerkin a most sweet robe of durance? How now, mad wag, mad wag? What a night, nice whips and quiddities. What a plague have I to do with the sheriff's buff jerkin? Why, what have I to do with my hostess of the tavern? <clears throat> Well, the house called her to a reckoning many a times and oft. Did I ever call for thee to pay thy part? <laughs> Nay, I give thee thy due. Thou hast paid all there. <laughs> Yea, and elsewhere, so far as my coin would stretch, and where it would not, I have used my credit. <laughs> and so used it that were it not here, the parent that thou art a parent. But I pray thee, sweet wife, when thou art king, shall there be gallows standing in England, and with resolution fobbed as it is with a rusty curb of old thought of antic the law. Do not thou, when thou art king, hang a fee. No, thou shalt. Look. I'm as melancholy as a jib catterer. Loved bear. Or an old lion, or a lover's lute. Or the drowning of a Lincoln chair pie. What sayest thou to a hare, or the melancholy of more ditch? Thou hast the most unsavory similes, and are thee capable of corrupting the. and are thee the most rascalous, the most. comparative. Sweet young prince. <coughs> but how? An old lord of the council rated me the other day in the street about you, sir. Oh, I mocked him not, but he spoke wisely. <laughs> yet I regarded him not, yet he spoke wisely. And in the street, too. Thou didst well, for wisdom cries out in the streets, and no man regards it. <laughs> Thou hast the most damnable iteration, and in, in, in indeed capable of corrupting a saint. Oh, thou hast done much harm upon me, Hal. God forgive thee for it. But before I knew thee, I knew nothing. Now am I, if one should speak true, little more than one of the wicked. I must give over this life, and I will do it too by the Lord, and I do not call me villain. Where shall we take a purse tomorrow, Jack? Ah, ha, ha, soon, well, I will, I'll, I'll make one, and I do not call me villain and baffle me. I see a good amendment of life in thee, from praying to purse taking. Oh, oh why, tis my vocation, pal. Tis no sin for a man to labor in one's vocation. <laughs> Boys, ha, if man were to be saved by merit, what hole in hell were hot enough for him? This is the most 
omnipotent <laughs> villain that ever cried stand to a true man. Good morrow, Ned. Good morrow, sweet Hal. What says Monsieur Remorse? What says Sir John Sack and Sugar? <laughs> Jack, how agrees the devil in thee about thy soul? Well, but, my lads, my lads, tomorrow morning, by four o'clock, there are pilgrims going to Canterbury with rich offerings and traders riding to London with fat purses. Oh. I have wizards for you all. You have horses for yourselves. We may do it as secure as sleep. If you will go, I will stuff your purses full of crowns. If you will not, tarry at home and be hanged. Ah, hear ye, Edward. If I tarry at home and go not, I'll hang you for going. You will, <laughs> chops. Uh, nay, how wilt thou make one? Ooh, I rob? I a thief? Not I, by my faith. Why, there's neither honesty, manhood, nor good fellowship in thee, nor comest thou from the blood royal, if thou dare'st not stand, potentially. Well, come what will, I'll tarry at home. Nay, then, when thou art king, I, I, I'll prove a trait. I care not. Sir John, I prithee, leave the prince and me alone. I will lay him down such reasons for this adventure that he shall go. Ah, may God give thee the spirit of persuasion and him the ears of profiting that what thou sayest may move and that what he hears may be believed that the true prince may for recreation's sake prove a false thief. Ah, for the poor abuses of a time want countenance. Farewell. You shall find me in East Cheap. Farewell, the latter spring. Farewell, all hallowed summer. <laughs> now, my good and sweet honey lord, uh, ride with us tomorrow. I have a jest to execute that I cannot manage alone. Falstaff, Bardolph, Pedo, and Gadshill shall rob those men that we have already will aid. Yourself and I will not be there. And when they have the booty, if you and I do not rob them, Cut this head off from my shoulder. Well, how shall we part with them in setting forth? Why, we will set forth before or after them and appoint them a place of meeting where it is at our pleasure to fail. Then will they adventure upon the exploit themselves, which they'll have no sooner achieved but will set upon them. Yea, but tis like that they will know us by our horses, by our habits, and by all other appointments to be ourselves. Ah, it's our horses they shall not see. I'll tie them in the wood. Our visits we will change after we leave them, and Sarah, I have cases of butt from for the nonce to mask our noted outward garments. Yea, but I doubt they will be too hard for us. Well, for two of them, I know them to be as true-bred cowards as ever turned back. And for the third, <laughs> if he fight longer than he sees reason, I'll forswear ours. <laughs> the virtue of this jest will be the incomprehensible lies that this same fat rogue will tell us when we meet at supper. How thirty at least he fought! What wards, what blows, what extremities he endured! And in the reproof of this lies the jest! Well, I'll go with thee. Provide us all thing necessary and meet me tonight in East Cheap. There I'll sup. Farewell. Farewell, my lord. <laughs> I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that did seem to strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work. When they seldom come, they wished for come. And nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So, <clears throat> When this loose behavior I throw off and pay the debt I never promised it, by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes, and like bright metal on a sullen ground, my reformation glittering o'er my fault shall show more goodly, and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I'll so offend to make offense, 
a skill. Redeeming time when men think least. I will. and to be feared, than my condition, which hath been smooth as oil, soft as young down, and has therefore lost that title of respect that the proud soul ne'er pays but to the proud. Our house, my sovereign liege, little deserves the scourge of greatness to be used on it, and that same greatness too which our own hands have hoped to make so portly. My lord, Worcester, get thee gone, for I do see danger and disobedience in thine eye. Uh, sir, your presence is too bold and peremptory, and majesty might never yet endure the moody frontier of a servant brow. You have good leave to leave us. When we need your use and counsel, we will send for you. You were about to speak? Yea, my good lord. Those prisoners in your highness's name demanded which Harry Percy here at Holmden took were, as he says, not with such strength denied as is delivered to your majesty. Either envy, therefore, or misprision is guilty of this fault, and not my son. My liege, I did deny no prisoners. But I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, came there a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom. He, he was perfumed like a milliner, and twixt his finger and his thumb, he held a pouncet box, which ever and anon he gave his nose and took it away again, and... As the soldiers bore dead bodies by, he called them untaught knaves, unmannerly to bring a slovenly, unhandsome corpse betwixt the wind and his nobility. With many holiday and lady terms, he questioned me amongst the rest, demanded my prisoners in your majesty's behalf. I then, all smarting, with my wounds being cold, to be so pestered with a popinjay out of my grief and my impatience as in neglecting me I know not what, for he made me mad. To see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet and talk so like a waiting gentlewoman of guns and drums and wounds, God save the mark. And so I beseech you, let not his report come current for an accusation betwixt my love and your high majesty. The circumstance considered, good my lord, whate'er Lord Harry Percy then had said to such a person, and in such a place, at such a time, with all the rest retold, may reasonably die, and never rise to do him wrong, or any way impeach what then he said, so he unsay it now. And yet he doth deny his prisoners, but with proviso and exception that we, at our own charge, shall ransom straight his brother-in-law, the foolish Mortimer, who on my soul did willingly betray the lives that those he did lead to fight against that great magician, damned Glendower, whose daughter, as we hear, Mortimer hath lately married. Oh, well, Shall our coffers then be emptied to redeem a traitor home? No. On the barren mountains let him starve, for I shall never call that man my friend whose tongue shall ask me for one penny's cost to ransom home revolted Mortimer. Revolted Mortimer! <laughs> he never did fall off my sovereign liege. 
but by the chance of war. Despite those mouthed wounds which valiantly he took when on the gentle severance, sedgy bank in single opposition, hand to hand, he did confound the best part of an hour in changing Hardiman with great Glendower. Let not his name be slandered with revolt. Thou dost belie him, Percy, thou dost belie him. He never did encounter with Glendower. Oh, he'd soon as meet the devil alone as Owen Glendower for an enemy. But, sirrah, let me not hear you speak of Mortimer. Send me your prisoners by the speediest means, or you shall hear in such a kind from me as will displease you. My Lord Northumberland, we license your departure with your son. Send me your prisoners, or you shall hear of it. And if the devil come and roar for them, I will not send them! I will ask her straight and tell her so, for I will ease my heart, albeit I make a hazard of my head. What? Drunk with color, stay and pause a while. Here comes your answer. Speak of Mortimer Stones, I will speak of him, and, and let my soul want mercy if I do not join with him. Yea, on his part, I'll empty all these veins and shed my dear blood drop by drop in the dust. But I will lift the downtrod Mortimer as high in the air as this unthankful king, as this inward cack of bone from. Brother, the king hath made your nephew mad. Who struck this heat up after I was gone? <coughs> Ye will forsooth have all my prisoners. And when I urge the ransom once again of my wife's brother, then her cheek looked pale, and on my face she turned an eye of death, trembling even at the name of Mortimer. I cannot blame her. Was he not proclaimed by Richard that dead is the next of blood? He was. I heard the proclamation that it was for the unhappy king whose wrongs in us God pardon. It set forth upon his Irish expedition from whence he intercepted, did return to be deposed and shortly murdered. And for whose death we in the world's wide mouth live scandalized and foully spoken of. Soft, I pray you, did King Richard then proclaim my brother Edmund Mortimer heir to the crown? He did. Myself did hear it. Nay, then I cannot blame his cousin King that wished him on the barren mountain starved. But shall it be that you that set the crown upon the head of this forgetful woman and for her sake wear the detested plot of murderous subornation as both of you, God pardon it, have done to put down Richard. Sweet, lovely rose, to plant this thorn, this, this canker, falling brook. Shall it in more shame be further spoken that you are fooled discarded and, and shook off by her for whom these shames you underwent. No! Yet time serves wherein you may redeem your banished honors, restore yourselves into the good thoughts of the world again, revenge the jeering and disdained contempt of this proud king who studies day and night to answer all the debt she owes to you in with the bloody payments of your debt. Therefore, I say peace! Cousin. Say no more. And now I will unclasp unto your quick conceiving discontents a hidden book and read you secrets dangerous. <laughs> send, send danger from the east unto the west, so honor cross it from the north to south. Uh -huh. Oh, the blood more stirs to rouse a lion than to, than to start a hare. The imagination of some great exploit drives him beyond the bounds of by heaven, methinks to her an easy leap to, to pluck right honor from the pale-faced moon, or, or dive into the bottom of the deep where fathom line could never touch the ground, and pluck up drowned honor by the locks, so he that doth redeem her thence might wear without co-rival all her dignities. But out upon this half-faced fellowship! He apprehends a world of figures here, but not the form of what he should attend. 
Good cousin, give me audience for a while. Cry you, mercy. Those same noble Scots that are your prisoners. Well, I'll keep them all, my God. She shall not have a Scot of them. No, if a, if a Scot would, would save her soul, she shall not keep them by this hand. You start away and lend no ear unto my purposes. Those prisoners you shall keep. Nay, them. I will, that slat. <laughs> She said she would not ransom Mortimer, for bad my tongue to speak of Mortimer. I will find her where she lies asleep, and, and in her ear I'll haul a Mortimer! I'll have a starling. She'll be taught to speak nothing but Mortimer, 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 give it her! Keep her anger still in motion. Hear you, cousin, a word. All studies here I solemnly defy, save how to gall and pinch that bawling brook and that same sword and buckler, Prince of Wales. But that I think his mother loves him not, would be glad he met with some mischance. I would have him poisoned with a pot of ale. Farewell, <laughs> kinsman. I'll talk to you when you are better tempered to attend. Oh, why, what a wasp stung and impatient. For fool art thou to break into this woman's mood? Tying thine ear to no tongue but thine own. Look, look you! I am whipped and scourged with rod, nettled and stung with ants when I hear of this vile politician Bolingbroke in Richard's time. I, uh, what do you call the place? Think upon it, tis in Gloucestershire. Twas where the, the, the madcap duke, her uncle, her uncle York, where I first I bowed my knee and show this. King of smiles, this bowling brook. At Slot, when you and she came back from Ravensburg. At Barclay Castle. Oh, you, you say truth. What, what a candy deal of courtesy this fawning greyhound then did proffer me. Look when his infant fortune came to age, and gentle Harry Percy, and kind cousin. The devil! Take such prisoners. God forgive me. But uncle, tell your tale I have done. Nay, if you have not, do it again. <laughs> we will stay your leisure. I have done in faith. Then, once more to your Scottish prisoners, deliver them up without their ransom straight. And make the Douglas son your only mean for powers in Scotland. The which, for divers reasons, which I will send you written, be assured will easily be granted. You, my lord, your son in Scotland being thus employed, shall secretly unto the bosom creep of that same noble prelate, well beloved, the Archbishop. Of York, is it not? True. Who bears hard his brother's death at Bristol, the Lord Scroop. I speak not this in estimation of what I think might be, but... What I know is ruminated, plotted, and set down, and only stays but to behold the face of that occasion that shall bring it on. I smell it! Upon my life, it will do well! Before the game is afoot, thou still let I cannot choose but be a noble plot. <laughs> and then the powers of Scotland and of York to join with Mortimer, huh? And so they shall. It is exceedingly well aimed. And tis no little reason bids us speed to save our heads by raising of a head. Forbear ourselves as even as we can. The king will always think her in our debt and think we think ourselves unsatisfied till she has found a time to pay us home. And see already how she doth begin to make us strangers to her looks of love. She does? She does. We'll be revenged on her. Cousin, farewell. No further go in this than I by letters shall direct your course. When time is ripe, which will be suddenly, I'll steal to Glendower and Lord Mortimer, where you and Douglas and our powers at once, as I will fashion it, shall happily meet to bear our fortunes in our own strong arms, which now we hold at much uncertainty. Farewell, good brother. We shall thrive, I trust. Uncle! Adieu! Oh. oh, let the hours be short till fields and blows and groans applaud our sport. Come, come, shelter, shelter.
shelter. I have removed Falstaff's horse, and he frets like a gun velvet. Stand close. Points. Points and be hanged. Psst. Psst. Huh? Points. Peace, you fat kidney huh? rascal. What a brawling dost thou keep? Hey, where's Points, Hal? Now he is walked up to the top of the hill. I'll go seek him. Oh. I'm cursed to rob in that thief's company. The rascal has taken my horse and tied him I know not where. Oh, if I travel but four foot by the square further afoot, I shall break my wind. Oh, pardon me. Oh. Well, I doubt not but to die a fair death for all this if I escape hanging for killing the rogue. Well, I have forsworn the rascal's company hourly this two and twenty-two years, and 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 and, and, and yet I'm still bewitched by the rogue's company. The rascal must have given me medicines to make me love him. It cannot be else. I have drunk medicines. Points, Hal, the plague upon you both, Bottle, Peter. <coughs> oh, oh. I shall starve and I rob a foot further. No, no, you're, you're, you're eight yards of uneven ground is, is three score and ten miles a foot with me. And the stony hearted rascals know it well enough. Oh, a plague upon it. When thieves cannot be true, one to the other. <laughs> oh, a plague upon you all. Ah, oh, give me my horse, you rogues, and give me my horse, I behave. Peace, you. Fat guts, lie down, lay thine ear close to the ground, and list if thou canst hear the tread of travelers. Dost thou have any levers to lift me up again? <laughs> <laughs> I'll not carry my flesh so far afoot for all the coin in thy mother's exchequer. What a plague means thou to cult me thus? Thou liest, thou art not culted. Thou art unculted. Yeah. <laughs> I pray thee, sweet prince, help me to my horse, good king. Oh, out, you rogue! Shall I be your ostler? Oh, go hang yourself with your own Earl of Earl and Garda, and I'll be taken out peach for this. <laughs> uh, if I do not have ballads made on you all and sunk to bawdy tunes, uh, let a couple sack be my poison. When I just is so far forward, and a foot too, I hate it. Hmm? Oh, so I do against my will. Oh, tis our tether, I know his voice. Bardo, what news? Kiss, 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 kiss. On with your visit. Money from the king's coming down the hill. It's going to the king's death, checker. Ah, you lie, you rogue. Tis going to the king's tavern. <laughs> There's enough to make us all. Oh. Sirs. You four shall front them in a the narrow lane. Uh, oh. Ned Coins and I will walk lower. If they escape from your encounter, then they light on us. How many be there of them? Uh, some eight or ten. Soon will they not rob us? To what? A coward, Sir John Paunch? Indeed, I am not John of Gaunt, your grandfather. And yet no coward, Hal. Well, we leave that to the proof. <laughs> ah, Sir yeah. Jack. Thy horse stands behind the hedge. When thou needest him, oh. there thou shalt find him. Oh. Farewell, oh. and stand oh. fast. Oh. Oh. Now could I not strike him, should I be hanged? Ned, where are our disguises? Here, hard by, stand close. Oh. Oh. Now, my masters, happy man be his soul. Now, every man to his business. <laughs> um, the boy will bring our
to be there in respect of the love I bear your house. Oh, he could be content. Why is he not then? In, in respect of the love he bears our house. He shows him this. He loves his own barn better than he loves our house. Let me see some more. <clears throat> the purpose you undertake is dangerous. The friends you have named uncertain. Time itself unsorted and your whole plot too light for the counterpoise of so great an opposition. <laughs> say you so, say you so. Well, I say unto you, you are a shallow, cowardly hind, and you lie. What a lap brain is this? By the Lord, our plot is as good a plot as ever was laid. Our friends, true and constant, good plot, good friends, and, and full of expectation. An excellent plot, very good friends. So, Ah, and I were not by this rascal. I could brain him with his lady's fan. Is there, is there not my mother, my uncle, and myself, Lord Edmund Mortimer, my lord of York, and Owen Glendower? Is there not besides the Douglas? Oh. Have I not all their letters, their letters, to, to meet me in arms by the ninth of the next month? And, and are they not some of them set forward already? Oh, what a pagan rascal is this, an, an, an infidel. Yeah. Uh, you shall see now, in very sincerity of fear and cold heart, will he to the king and lay open all our proceedings. Uh, I could divide myself and go to buffets for moving such a dish of skimmed milk with so honorable an action. Hang him. Let him tell the king. We are prepared. I will set forth tonight. Oh, oh no. Kate. Oh, I, I must leave you within these two hours. Oh, my good lord, why are you thus alone? For what offense have I this fortnight been, a banished woman from my Harry's bed? Tell me. Sweet Lord, what is that takes from thee thy stomach, pleasure, and thy golden sleep? Why dost thou bend thine eyes upon the earth and start so often when thou sitst alone? Why hast thou lost the fresh blood in thy cheeks and given my treasures and my rights of thee to thick eyed musing and cursed melancholy oh. in thy faint slumbers? I by thee have watched and heard thee murmur tales of iron wars. Speak terms of manage to thy bounding steed. Cry courage to the field, and thou hast talked of sallies and retires, of trenches, tents, of palisados, frontiers, parapets, of basilisks, of cannon, culverin, of prisoners' ransom, and of soldiers slain, and all the currents of a heady fight. Thy spirit within thee hath been so at war, and thus hath so bestirred thee in thy sleep, that beads of Sweat have stood upon thy brow like bubbles in some late disturbed stream, and on thy face strange motions have appeared, such as we see when men restrain their breath on some great sudden hest. Oh, what portents are these? Some heavy business hath my lord in hand, and I must know it else. He loves me not. But ho, 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 ho! Oh. Is Gilliams with the packet gone? Here's my lord an hour ago. Had Butler brought those horses from the sheriff? One horse, my lord, he brought even now. What horse? A roan? A crop ear, is it not? It is, my lord. Oh, that roan shall be my throne. Well, I will back him straight. Oh, Esperance. Bid Butler lead him forth into the park. But hear you, my lord. What says thou, my lady? What is it carries you away? 
My horse, my love, my horse! Out, you mad-headed ape! A weasel hath not such a deal of spleen as you are tossed with! In faith, I'll know thy business, Harry, that I will. I fear my brother Mortimer doth stir about his title, and hath sent for you to line his enterprise, but if you go... So far apart, I shall be weary, love! Come, come, you paraquito, answer me directly unto this question that I ask. In faith, I'll break thy little finger, Harry, and thou wilt not tell me all things true. Away, away, you trifler of love! I love thee not, I cannot for thee, Kate! This is no world to, to, to play with mammoths and to tilt with lips. We must have bloody noses and cratch crowns and, and pass them current too. We, my heart. What sayest thou, Kate? What wouldst thou have with me? Do you not love me? Do you not indeed? Well, do not then, and since you love me not, I will not love myself. Do you not love me? Nay, tell me if you speak in jest or no. Oh, come, come, come. Oh. Wilt thou see me ride? And when I am a horseback, I will swear I love thee infinitely. But hark you, Kate, I must not have you henceforth question me whither I go, no reason whereabout, whither I must, I must. And to conclude, this evening must I leave you, gentle Kate, I, I, I know you what. No farther wise than <laughs> Harry Percy's wife, <laughs> constant you are, but yet a woman oh. <laughs> for, for secrecy. No lady closer, for I well believe thou wilt not utter what thou dost not know, and <clears throat> so far will I trust thee, gentle Kate. How? <clears throat> so far? Not an inch closer. <laughs> what hark you, Kate? Whither I go, thither shall you go too. Today will I set forth, tomorrow you. Will this content you, Kate? It must, of force. <laughs> Let them alone a while and then open the door. Points, Sira, false step, and the rest of the thieves are at the gate. Shall we be merry? As merry as crickets, my lad. Oh, I am now of all humors. I am not yet of Percy's mind, the hotspur of the north. He that kills me some six or seven dozen Scots at a breakfast, washes his hands and says to his wife, fie upon this quiet life, I want work. <laughs> Oh, my sweet Harry, says she, how many hast thou killed today? Some! Fourteen! A trifle! A trifle! <laughs> <laughs> I prithee, call in Falstaff! Call in ribs, call in tallow! <laughs> Welcome, Jack. Where hast thou been? A plague upon our cowards, I say. And a vengeance too, marry now, man. Come, uh, give me a cup of sack. Oh. <laughs> Be quick about it. Uh. <laughs> oh, you wench! There's lime in the sack! Oh, what a villainous coward! 
besides, <laughs> there's nothing but roguery be to found in this villainous world. But a coward is worse than a couple of sack with lime in it. A villainous coward. <laughs> there, 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 there be not three good men left alive in all of England, and one of them is fat and grows old. <laughs> Plague of all cowards, I say. How now, Woolsack? What mutters you? Ah, a king's son. Oh, not you, a, 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 a coward. If I do not beat thee out of thy kingdom with a stage dagger and drive all thy flock before thee like, like a flock of sheep, I'll never wear hair on my face again, you prince of Wales. <laughs> Why, you horse and round man? What's the matter? Are not you a coward? Answer me to that. And points there. Suit you fat <laughs> paunch, and you call me coward. By <laughs> the Lord, I'll stab thee. Uh, I call thee coward. Uh, I'll see thee damned that I call thee coward. Uh, I give a thousand marks, I could run as fast as thou canst. You are straight enough in the shoulders. You care not who sees your back. You call that backing of your friends? A plague upon such backing. Uh, Give me a cup of sack, I'm a rogue, if I drunk today. Oh, villain, thy lips are scarce white since thou drunkest last. No one for that. Ah, oh. ah plague of all cowards, still I say. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? There be four of us have ta'en a thousand pound this day morning. Where is it, Jack? Where is it? Where is it? Came from us it is. A hundred upon poor four of us. <laughs> what? A hundred, man? Oh, I'm a rogue if I were not a half sword with a dozen of them. Two hours together. Oh, I've escaped by miracle. I am pierced eight times through the double. Four through the host. My sword hacked like a hand sword. I never dealt better since I was a man of plague of all cowards. Let them speak. If they speak more or less than truth, then they know. Oh, you over here, you here. They are villains and the sons of darkness. Well, speak, sirs, how was it? Uh, we four set upon some to dozen. Uh, Sixteen, my lord. And, and bound them. No, no, they were not bound. No, you rogue, they were bound, every man of them. And, and, and then, as we were sharing, some six or seven fresh men set upon us. And unpound the rest. And then came in the other. <laughs> what fought you with them all? Oh, ha, I know not what you call all. But if I were not at half sword with 50 of them, I'm a bunch of radish. <laughs> If there were not two or three and fifty on poor old Jack, then am I no two-legged creature. Pray God you have not murdered some of them. Nay, hey, that's past praying for. I have peppered two. Two, I am sure I have paid. Two men in Buckram. I tell thee what, Hal. If I tell thee a lie, spit my face, call me horse. Thus I lay, and thus I bore my point. These four in Buckram that I told thee of. What four? Thou saidst but two even now. Four, Hal, I told thee four. Aye, aye. He said four. <laughs> These four came all affront and made me thrust at me. I made no more to do but took all seven of their points in my counter. Thus. Seven? Why, there were even four but now. In Buckram? By four in Buckram suits. Ah, seven by these hilts, or I'm a villain else. Prithee, let him alone. We shall have more anon. <laughs> <laughs> Dost thou hear me, Hal? Aye, and mark thee too, Jack. <laughs> Do so, for it is worth the listening to. <laughs> now, these nine I told thee of. So, two more already. Yeah? Their points being broken began to give me ground. But I made no more ado, but followed me close, hand and foot, foot and hand, and in an instant, seven of the eleven I pay! Oh, monstrous! Eleven Buckram men grown out of two! Uh, but how? As the devil would have it, three misbegotten knaves in Kendall Green came at my back and let drive at me. Oh, it was so dark, Hal. 
thou couldst not see thy hand before thy face. These lies are like their father that begets them. Gross as a mountain, open, palpable. Why, thou clay-brained guts, thou naughty-painted fool, thou horson, obscene, greasy, tallow cat. What odd man, odd man, is not the truth? The truth. Why, how couldst thou know these men in Kendall Green when it was so dark thou couldst not see thy hand? <laughs> Come, tell us your reason, Jack. What sayest thou to this? Your reason, Jack, your reason. Why? Give me a reason upon compulsion. Ah, ah, were I at the strapado or all the racks in the world, I would not give thee a reason upon compulsion. Oh, reason on. It, 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 if reasons were as plentiful as blackberries, I would not give thee a reason upon compulsion. I. I'll be no longer guilty of this sin, this sanguine coward, this bed presser, this <laughs> horseback breaker, <laughs> this huge hill of you flesh. You starling, you elfskin, oh. you dry meat tongue, you fool's pistol, oh. you stockfish. Oh, for breath to say what is like thee. You, 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 you tailor's yard, you sheath, you bow case, you vile, standing, tough wall. Oh, 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 oh. Breathe a while and then to it again. And when thou hast tired thyself in base comparisons, hear me speak but this. Mark, Jack. We two saw you four set on four and bound them and were masters of their wealth. Mark now how a plain tale shall put you down. Then did we two set on you four and with a word outfaced you from your prize and have it yea you can show it you here in the house. <laughs> And Falstaff, you carried your guts away as nimbly, with as quick dexterity, and roared for mercy, and still run and roared as ever I heard bull calf. What a slave art thou to hack thy sword as thou hast done, and then say it was in fight? Come. What trick, what device, what starting hole canst thou now find to hide thee from this open and apparent shame? Come, Jack, what trick hast thou now? <laughs> I knew thee as well as he that <laughs> What, masters? Was it for me to kill the heir of Helen? Should I turn upon the true prince? <laughs> what I know is I am as valiant as Hercules. <laughs> but beware instinct. The lion will not turn upon the true prince. I was now a coward on instinct. <laughs> I should think the better of myself and thee during my life, myself for the valiant lion, and thee for the true prince. But lad, I'm glad you have the money. Hostess, clap to the doors. What's the night? Tomorrow. <laughs> Gallants, lads. Boys, hearts of gold, all titles of good fellowship of bonding. What? Shall we be married? <laughs> oh, sheep cheerings over the summer is past. Here's a help to our mistress. Hey. All in a full glass. She is a good woman, and she brings us good cheer. Here's a help to our mistress in a full glass of beer! <laughs> Here's a toast unto our mistress, she's the founder of the feast. Our hostess is that I have known she is by far the best. Hey! She's hoping that she prospers in whatever she takes in hand. For we are all the servants and we are at her command. So drink, boys, drink! And see that you do not spill, for if you do, you shall drink too. Oh, that is the lady's will. So drink, boys, drink! And see that you do not spill, for if you do, you shall drink too. Oh, that is the lady's will. Well, since we've drunk the mistress' help, 
I should or how to breathe. There's no one in the tavern who can drink as much as he. Hey! He fights, he steals, he likes the girls. Hey! He So drink, boys, drink, and see that you do not spill, for if you do, you shall drink two more, that is our ladies' will. So drink, boys, drink, and see that you do not spill, for if you do, you shall drink two more, that is our ladies' will. as will make him a royal min and send him back again to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of man is he? An old man. What doth gravity out of bed at midnight? Shall I give him his answer? Prithee do, <coughs> Jack. Ah, the faith, and I'll send him packing. Yeah. <laughs> now, sirs, by your lady, you fought fair, so did you, Pedo, so did you, Bardal. You are lions too, you ran away upon instinct. You will not touch the true prince. Oh, no, fie. Oh, in faith, I, I ran when I saw the others run. Faith, tell me now in earnest, how came Falstaff's sword so high? He hacked it with his dagger, and said he would swear truth out of England and make you believe it was done to fight. But he persuaded us to do the like. <laughs> and then tickle our nose with spear grass and make us bleed, and then beslubber our garments with it and make us swear it was the blood of true men. <laughs> oh, I did as I did not the seven year before. I blush to hear his monstrous devices. Oh, villain. <laughs> thou stole a cup of sack 18 years ago, and wert taken with the manor, and ever since thou hast blushed extempore. <laughs> thou hadst fire and sword on thy side. And yet thou rannest away. What instinct is there for it? Um, my lord, do you see these meteors? <laughs> you behold these exhalations. I do. What think you they portend? Hot ah. livers and cold purses. <laughs> Call on my lord if rightly taken. Nay, if rightly taken. Halter. Oh. Oh. Here comes lean Jack. Here comes bare bones. How now? My sweet creature of bombast. How long is ago, Jack, since thou hast sauced thine own knee? My <laughs> <laughs> own knee? When I was about five years, how? I was no more than an eagle's talon in the waist. They could have crawled to any old man's thumb ring. A oh, plague of sighs and griefs. It blows a man up like a bladder. But there's villainous news abroad. That same mad fellow of the North Percy, and the he of Wales, Owen Glendower, and Northumberland, and that sprightly sprite of Scots, Douglas, he that rides up a hill perpendicular. He that rides fast and with his pistol kills a sparrow flying. Ah, <laughs> yet hit it, so did he, never the sparrow. <laughs> well, there's good metal in him, he will not run. Why, what a rascal art thou then, to praise him so for running? Ah, the horseback, you cuckoo. But he will not a foot, he will not budge a foot. Nay, <laughs> Jack, upon instinct. <laughs> oh, I grant him, upon instinct. <laughs> well, he is there in one more day, too, and a thousand blue caps more. Worse than is stolen away tonight, your mother's hair is turned white at the news. You may buy lamb now as cheap as stinking mackerel. <laughs> but how? Art thou not horrible of fear, thou being heir apparent? Could the world have picked thee out three such enemies as that spirit Percy, that fiend Douglas, or that devil Glendower? Art thou not horrible of fear? Doth it not make thy blood thrill? Not a whit. Faith, 
I lack some of thy instincts. <laughs> well, thou wouldst be horrible chid when thou comest to thy mother. And thou loved me. Practise an answer. Do thou stand for my mother and examine me upon the particulars of my life? Ah, oh. Shall I? Hand, hand. <laughs> this bed shall be my state, this dagger my scepter, ah, and this cushion my crown. Get me a cup of sack to make my eyes look red, for it must seem that I have wept, for I must speak in a passion, and I will do it in some actor's Ranting extremis! Oh. Oh. Well, here is my leg. And here is my speech. Stand aside, my lord. Oh, Jason, this is excellent sport. Uh, stand aside, sweet queen. Uh, trickling tears are in vain. Father, oh, how he holds his uh, countenance. By the lord, convey my trishful queen, for tears do stop Bloodgates of the Lord! Jason, we love the dislike one of these harlotry players as ever I see. good pipe. <laughs> Peace, good pickle brain. Now, uh, Harry! <laughs> oh, uh, tiresome guitar. Uh, now, not only do I marvel where thou hast been, but the company that thou keep'st Although the chamomile, the more is trodden on, the faster it grows, yet you, the more is wasted, the sooner it wears. That thou art, my son, I have partly thy father's word for it. <laughs> partly my own opinion, but chiefly a villainous trick of thine eye, and a foolish hanging of thy nether lip that doth warrant thy father. Therefore, being son to me, here lies the point. Why, being son to me, are thou so pointed at? Shall the son of England prove a mitcher and eat blackberries? Oh, a question not to be asked. Shall the king of England prove a thief and take purses? A question to be asked. Now, Harry, I do not speak to thee in drink. But in tears, not in pleasure, but in passion, not in words only, but in woes also. And yet, there is a virtuous man I have often noted in thy company, and yet I know not his name. What manner of man, and it's like your majesty. A goodly Portly man, <laughs> a face and a corpulent, of a pleasing eye, a cheerful look, and a most noble countenance, and as I think his age, some fifty or <laughs> oh, 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 by your lady inclining to sixty, and now I recall his name, his name is Falstaff. <laughs> if that man be lewdly given, I am much deceived, for I see virtue in his looks. So, as the tree may be told by the fruit, as the fruit by the tree, preemptorily I say it, there is virtue in that Falstaff. <laughs> Him, keep with, uh -huh. arrest, banish. Oh, oh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Do thou speak like a king. Do thou stand for me, and I will play my mother. Deep oh, hey, 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 hey. And thou hey, dost hey, have so great, hey, hey, have so hey, hey, majestically, hey, hey, both in word and matter. Hang me up on my heels for a rabbit sucker, for a vulture's hair. <laughs> here I am set, and here I stand. Judge, my masters. Now, Harry, whence come thou? My noble lord, from East Chief. <laughs> the complaints I hear of thee are grievous. Splat, my lord, they are false. Swearest thou, <laughs> ungracious boy? Henceforth ne'er look on me. Thou art violently carried away from grace. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old Bat man. <laughs> a ton of man is thy companion. Why? 
dost thou converse with that trunk of humors, <laughs> that bolting hutch of beastliness, <laughs> that swollen parcel of dropsies, <laughs> that huge bombard of sack, <laughs> that stuffed cloak bag of guts, <laughs> that roasted manning tree ox with the pudding in his belly. <laughs> Wherein is he good, but to taste sack and drink it? Wherein neat and cleanly, but to carve a cape on and eat it? Wherein cunning, but in craft? Wherein crafty, but in villainy? Wherein villainous, but in all things? Wherein worthy, but in nothing? Uh, I would your grace would take me with you. Who means your grace? <laughs> Why, that villainous, abominable, misleader of you, Falstaff, yeah. that old white-bearded Satan. I partly know the man, my lord. I know thou dost. <laughs> Not to say I know more harm in him than in myself, or to say more than I know. <laughs> that he's old, the more the pity, his white hairs do witness it. That he is saving or reverence, a whore, master, I utterly deny. <laughs> if sack and sugar be a fault, then God help the wicked. <laughs> if to be old and merry be a sin, then many a host I know be damned. I... <laughs> if to be fat be to be hated, then pharaohs Lean kind ought to be loved. No. Banish Peto. Banish Bordo. Banish Poin. But good Jack Falstaff? Kind Jack Falstaff. True Jack Falstaff. Valiant Jack Falstaff. And all the more that it being as he is old. Jack Falstaff, banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish plump Jack. And banish all the world. I do. I will. Oh, my lord, this sheriff had a monstrous watch her at the door. Peace, you clown. <laughs> out, out, you play on the play. I have much to say on behalf of that Falstaff. Oh, Jesus, my lord, my lord. Hey, hey, the, the devil rides upon a fiddlestick. What's the matter? The sheriff and all the watch are at the door. They are come to search the house. Shall I let them in? How? <laughs> Never call a true piece of gold a counterfeit. <laughs> thou art essentially mad without seeming And so. thou a natural coward without instinct. I deny your major premise. So, if, if you deny the sheriff so, if not, let him enter. If I become not a cot as well as another man, a plague upon my bringing up. Uh, I hope I shall as soon be strangled with a halter as another man. Go. Hide thee behind the heiress. The rest of you walk above. Now, my masters. Now, for a good face, a true conscience, both of which I have had. But the date is out, and so I will hide thee. Call in the sheriff. Sheriff, what is your will with me? Bust! Uh, pardon me, my lord. <laughs> A hue and cry hath followed some men unto this house. What men? <laughs> One of them is well known, my gracious lord. A gross fat man. <laughs> as fat as butter. The man, I do assure you, is not here, for I myself at this time have employed him. And, Sheriff, I will engage my word to thee that I will, by Tomorrow dinner time, send him to answer thee, or any man for anything he shall be charged with all. So let me treat you, leave the house. I will, my lord. Ooh. The 
Uh, our two gentlemen have in this robbery lost 300 marks. It may be so. If he have robbed these men, he shall be answerable. So farewell. Good night, my noble lord. I think it is good morrow, is it not? I Indeed, my lord. I think it be two o'clock. The oily rascal is known as well as the Pope. Go call him forth. Falstaff. <laughs> Fast asleep behind the heiress, and snorting like a horse. Oh, hark! How hard he fetches breath. Search his pockets. Uh, 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 what does that find? Uh, uh, nothing but papers, my lord. Well, let's see what they be. Read them. Uh, item: capon, two shilling, two pence. Item: sauce, four pence. Item: sack, two gallons. <laughs> Five shillings, eight pence. Item anchovies and sack after supper, two shillings, six pence. <laughs> Item bread, a halfpenny. Oh, monstrous. But one half penny worth of bread to this intolerable deal of sack. <laughs> For what there is else keep close, we shall read it at more advantage. There let him sleep till day. I'll to the courts in the morning. We must all to the wars. And thy place shall be honorable. I'll procure this fat rogue a charge of foot, and I know his death will be a march of twelve score. <laughs> oh, the money shall be paid back again with advantage. The youth the times in the morning. And so, good morrow, Cat's Hill. Good morrow. Mike, good lord. These promises are fair, the party's sure, and our induction full of prosperous hope. Oh, Lord Mortimer! Cousin Glendower, will you sit down? And Uncle Worcester. Sit, Cousin Percy. Mm -hmm. Sit, good Cousin Hotspur. For by that name, as oft as the king doth speak of you, her cheek grows pale, and with a rising sigh, she wishes you in heaven. And you in hell! <laughs> as oft as she hears Owen Glendower spoke of. I cannot blame her. At my nativity, the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes, of burning crescents. And at my birth, the frame and huge foundation of the earth shaked like a coward. So it would have done in the same season if your mother's cat had been kittened and yourself had never been born. I say the earth did shake when I was born. And I say the earth was not of my mind if you suppose as fearing you it shook. The heavens were all on fire, and the earth did tremble. Oh, well, then the earth shook to see the heavens on fire. Not in, not in fear of your nativity. <laughs> Diseased nature oftentimes breaks forth in strange eruptions. Off the teeming earth is with a kind of calling pinched and vexed by the imprisoning of unruly wind within her womb which for enlargement striking shakes the old beldam earth and topples down steeples and moss-grown towers. <clears throat> At your birth, our grandam earth having this distemperature in passion shook. Cousin, of many men I do not bear these crossings. Give me leave to tell you once again that at my birth, the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes. Goats ran from the mountain, and the herds were strangely clamorous to the frighted fields. These signs have marked me extraordinary, and all the courses of my life do show I am not in the role of common men. Where is he living? clipped in by the sea that chides the banks of England, Scotland, Wales, which calls me pupil, or hath read to me, 
bring him out, that his but mother's son can trace me in the tedious paths of art, or hold me pace in deep experiments. I think there's no man speaks better Welsh out to dinner. <laughs> Peace, cousin Percy, you will make him mad. I can call spirits from the vasty deep. Why, so can I, or so can any man. But will they come when you do call for them? <laughs> <laughs> Why, I can teach you, cousin, to command the devil. I can teach thee, cousin, to shame the devil by telling truth. Tell truth and shame the devil. If thou have power to raise him, bring him hither. I'll be sworn I have power to shame him hence. Oh, while you live, tell truth and shame the devil. Come, come! No more of this unprofitable chance. Three times hath Bolingbroke made head against my power. Thrice from the banks of Wye and Sandy Bottom Severn have I sent her bootless home and weather beaten back. Now home without boots and in foul weather too. How scaped she agues in the devil's name. <laughs> A shorter time shall send me to your lords, and in my conduct shall your ladies come, from whom you now must steal and take no leave, for there will be a world of watershed upon the parting of your wives and you. <laughs> Fie, cousin Percy, how you cross my father! I cannot choose! Sometime he angers me with telling me of the mold warp and the ant, of the dreamer Merlin and his prophecies, and of a dragon and a finless fish! <laughs> I tell you what, he held me last night at least nine hours in reckoning up the several devil's names that were his lackeys. I cried, ho, oh, go to him, mark him not a word. He is as tedious as, as, a, as a tired horse. Faith, he is a worthy gentleman. Exceedingly well read, as, as valiant as a lion, and as wondrous affable and as boundless as vines of India. <laughs> Shall I tell you, cousin? He holds your temper in a high respect. And, and curbs himself even of his natural scope when you come across his humor. <laughs> Faith, he does! I warrant you that man is not alive, might so have tempted him as you have done, without the taste of danger and reproof. But do not use it off, let me entreat you! In faith, my lord, you are too willful blame, and since your coming hither have done enough to put him quite beside his patience. You needs must learn, lord, to amend this fault. Though sometimes it show greatness, courage, blood, yet oftentimes it doth present harsh rage, defect of manners, want of government, pride, haughtiness, opinion, and disdain. The least of which, haunting a nobleman, loseth men's hearts, and leaves behind a stain upon the beauty of all parts besides, beguiling them of commendation. Well, I am schooled. Good manners be your speed. Oh, here come our wives. <laughs> I tell all Rupo Primochi, with Afinic delay on she a on their forehead here, and with Afinic Gadil. This is the deadly spite that angers me. My wife can speak no English, I no Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter weeps. She will not part with you. She'll be a soldier too, chilled to the wars. Good father. Tell her that she and my Aunt Percy shall follow in your conduct speedily. Mind thou it to be in a feeling and goof me. Gaddy with you make on and hard play with. Do we? She bids you on the wanton rushes lay you down and rest your gentle head upon her lap. And she will sing the song that pleaseth you and on your eyelids crown the god of sleep. Hold my heart, I'll sit and hear her sing. Do so, and these musicians shall play for you. Come, Kate, thou art perfect in lying down. Come, quick, quick, that I may lay my head in thy lap. Go, ye giddy goose.
perceive the devil understands Welsh. <laughs> Tis no marvel. He is so humorous. Why, her lady, she is a good musician. Then should you be nothing but musical, for you are altogether governed by humors. Lie still, ye thief, and hear the lady singing well. I had rather hear lady, my dog, howling Irish. <laughs> now have thy head broken. Oh. Then be still. <laughs> Neither. Tis a woman's fault. Now God help thee. To the Welsh lady's bed. What's that? Peace. She sings. our book is drawn, we'll but seal, and then to horse immediately. With all my heart. I know not whether God will have it so for some displeasing service I have done, that in his secret doom out of my blood he'll breed revengement and a scourge for me. But thou dost appear in thy passages of life to be built only for the hot vengeance and the rod of heaven to punish my mistreadings. Tell me else, could such inordinate and low desires, such poor, such bare, such lewd, such mean attempts, barren pleasures as thou art grafted all and matched to, accompany the greatness of thy blood and hold their measure with thy princely heart. So please your majesty, I would I could quit all offenses I am charged with all, yet such extenuation. Let me beg that where in my youth I have faulty wandered, I may find pardon on my true submission. God pardon thee, but let me wonder, Harry, at thy affections, which do hold a wing quite from the flight of all thy ancestors. Thy place in council thou hast rudely lost, which by thy younger brother is supplied, and art almost alien to the hearts of all the court and princes of my blood. The hope and expectation of thy time is ruin, and the soul of every man prophetically forethinks thy fall. Had I so lavish of my presence been, so common hackneyed in the eyes of men, so stale and cheap to vulgar company, opinion that did help me to the crown, 
had kept still loyal to possession and left me in reputeless banishment, a woman of no mark or likelihood, by being seldom seen. I could not stir, but like a comet I was wondered at. <laughs> that men would tell their daughters, this, this is she. And others would say, where? Which is Bolingbroke? And then I dressed myself in such humility and stole all courtesy from heaven that I did win allegiance from men's hearts. Loud shouts and salutations, even in the presence of the crowned king. Oh, the skipping king. He ambled up and down with shallow gestures and rash, bathin wits. Had his great name profaned, became a companion to the common streets, that being daily swallowed by men's eyes, they suffered with honey and began to loathe the taste of sweetness. And in that very line, Harry, standest thou for thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile participation. There's not a soul that is not weary of thy common sight, save mine that hath desired to see thee more, which now doth that I would not have it do make blind itself with foolish tenderness. I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious lord, be more myself for all the world as thou art to this hour was Richard then when I set foot from France at Ravensburg, and even as I was then, is Percy now. <laughs> he doth fill fields with harness in the realm, turns head against the lion's armed jaws, and being no more in debt to years than now, these ancient lords and reverend bishops on to bloody battles and bruising arms. Thrice hath this hot spur Mars in waddling clothes, this infant warrior in his enterprises, discomfited great Douglas, tain him once, enlarged him, made a friend of him to fill the mouth of deep defiance up and shake the peace and safety of our throne. What, what say you to this? Percy, Northumberland, his archbishop, the grace of York, Douglas, Mortimer capitulate against us and are up. <coughs> Wherefore do I tell this news to thee, hmm? Why, Harry, do I tell thee of my foes, who art my nearest and dearest enemy, who art like as not through vassal fear, base inclination, and a start of spleen to fight against me under Percy's pay, to dog at his heels, to curtsy at his frowns, and show how much thou art degenerate? Do not think so! You shall not find it so. And God forgive them that so much have swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from me. I will redeem all this on Percy's head and in the closing of some glorious day be bold to tell you that I am your son. When I will wear a garment all of blood and stain my favor with a bloody mask which washed away shall Scour my shame with it, and that will be the day when Aaron lights that this same child of honor and renown, this gallant Hotspur, this all praised knight, your unthought of Harry chance to meet. For I shall make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. Percy is but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf. And I shall call him to so strict account that he will render every glory up, yea, and even the slightest worship of his time, or I will tear the reckoning from his heart. This in the name of God I promise here, the which, if he be pleased, I shall perform. I do beseech your majesty, may salve the long-grown wounds of my intemperance. If not, the end of life cancels all bands, and I will die a hundred thousand deaths, ere break the smallest parcel of this vow. A hundred thousand rebels die in this. Thou shalt have charge 
and sovereign trust herein. <clears throat> How now, good blood? That looks so full of speed. So is the business that I come to speak of. The, the rebels met the 11th of this month at Shrewsbury. A mighty and a fearful head they are, if promises be kept on every hand, as ever offered foul play in the state. The Earl of Westmoreland set forth tonight with him, my son, Lord John of Lancaster, for this advertisement is five days old. On Wednesday next, Harry, you shall set forward and you shall march through Gloucestershire. On Thursday, we ourselves will march. Our meeting point is Bridge North. Our hands are full of business. Let's away. Advantage feeds him fat while men delay. <laughs> <laughs>